And so everyone was very excited about it because it was going to be prediction market. But the special thing about a prediction market is it can actually make an oracle. The money going in equals the money going out uh, among the different people making predictions. So it's zero sum among them. In prediction feeds, it can be positive sum because there's new money coming into the system from the people making money trading. 500,000 transactions per month, about $123 million um, dollars worth of volume per month. Uh, we've actually spiked as high as, um, I think, like $500 million per month. The data scientists sign up, download the data. You could say they're actually the consumers of the data, but we're the consumer of their predictions, which is based on our data and the models that they built upon the data. And that ends up being uh, very highly predictive and also lower volatility than individual models. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today um, we have a very special episode because I'm, I have not one, but I have two fantastic guests, uh, namely Trent McConaughey, the founder of Ocean, and Richard Crape, um, the founder of Numeri. And we're here to kind of talk about prediction markets and prediction feeds. So before we get into that, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance or networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white-label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi-chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Hey, Trent and Richard, it's good to have you both on. It's really good to come back. It's been a long time. And yeah. We we just checked this out and Richard was on seven years ago, which is like 70 years in like regular years. So uh, yeah, and Trent, I mean, you've been on regularly since. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I guess pretty common, but it's great to be on again. And, you know, I always speaking about something uh, different and crazy and it's great to join Richard today too. So uh, looking forward to it. Super nice. So Trent, I think you probably don't need an introdu introduction on this podcast, but let's do one anyways. So you are the founder of Ocean Protocol, um, which is a decentralized data marketplace enabling data sharing while preserving privacy. And you recently, or a year ago or so, launched a predict tour. Um, so tell us about that. Yeah, um, Predictor is a uh, crowdsourced time series prediction. So um, there's basically two types of uh, users. There's uh, data scientists that run um, scripts or call them simple bots that basically predict, um, will Bitcoin go up or down, yes or no, five minutes from now? And specifically, this would be, say, Bitcoin, USGT, PR, and Binance. And when they predict, they actually stake against it. They make money if they're correct and they lose money if they're wrong, basically. And so it's sort of this game among these different data scientists. And on the flip side, um, traders can come along and buy these signals and um, use them for alpha in their trading, for a different trading bots, et cetera. And this is really meant for people, you know, r running um, scripts and bots and that sort of thing on both sides, on both the prediction side and the, the trading side, um, because it is every five minutes or every hour. So that's what Predictor is about. Ultimately, it's about time series prediction. We have focused uh, initially on DeFi. Because we see, you know, it's got it's high volume and it is, um, you know, low latency. 
Uh, but we have interest in exploring time series prediction in other domains too, weather, energy, and more. So that's Ocean Predictor. Yeah, super nice. And Bridget, you founded Numerai um, a while back. So basically, it, it was the first time I kind of heard about homomorphic encryption. I remember reading up on this before the podcast that we did seven years ago, apparently. And I was like, ah, oh, this is fantastic. This is so cool. So basically, the idea is that kind of you have that kind of it, it kind of provides like a hedge fund like thing powered by crowdsourced predictions from data scientists and kind of they they kind of um, the way that they kind of predict things is on encrypted data. Um, so kind of so so as not to kind of leak um, any alpha. Um, and so kind of you, you've kind of come to this prediction space from the TradFi arena um, more recently, you kind of you launched Numerai Crypto, but maybe let's start, let's let's kind of stick with the traditional Numerai for now. So t tell us about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, Numerai. That was the key innovation of Numerai. Is like we found a way to share this data set uh, that we had that was very expensive, and we wouldn't want other people to take our data and just go and start their own hedge funds. And uh, it actually, right at the moment, the, the version of the data set, it's really more obfuscated than encrypted. Uh, in the early days of Numerai, um, we were trying to use homomorphic encryption. Uh, it was about a billion times too slow, and then it got to a million times too slow, and so it's still too slow. But I liked seeing this uh, many uh, entrepreneurs out there still uh, trying to apply uh, homomorphic encryption and crypto. Um, but... But yeah, the, the important thing is that no one can uh, see or know what the data is on Numerai, even though they can still model it. Like all the structure is there, but they can't, uh, can't, can't know what the features mean or what the stocks mean. And um, Numerai has grown a lot since then. We've become basically the biggest uh, online community of people uh, approaching this problem. And there's millions of dollars staked on models users stake their models uh, and we've also traded billions of dollars uh, a volume uh, in our global equity fund so it is quite remarkable how much it has kind of worked uh, since you know there's definitely been a lot of um, bumps along the way but it has pretty much we're doing the exact same thing we were doing probably in the last call seven years ago uh, just at a much bigger scale yeah super cool I assume most listeners will be familiar with prediction markets. Maybe let's give like a super short um, summary. Who, who of you wants to do that? I'll I'll give a bad one. Uh, I'm trying to <laughs> give a better one, but I'll scratch some of the surface area. You know, one of the things that's interesting for, with Numerai was I had just invested in and met with uh, Joey Krug, who started Augur. So you have to be maybe quite OG in crypto to remember Augur. Uh, but Augur was something that, that came out uh, shortly before Ethereum was launched. And so it was like, uh, it was like the type of thing that was a project that was uh, going to happen uh, on Ethereum once Ethereum had launched. And so everyone was very excited about it because it was going to be a prediction market. But the special thing about a prediction market is it can actually make an oracle. And so it's a way of getting uh, date, uh, information that's off-chain, uh, on-chain. And that is a really nice property of it uh, because it's not just about, hey, people are staking and betting and trying to win money. That's not the cool part. The cool part is that that market surfaces new information. Olga was my first experience with that. And you can see some uh, indication of that in sort of being something, a project that did kind of inspire Numerai to have users stake on their predictions so that the quality of those predictions would go up. Um, so brief, not very brief, but yeah, intro to prediction markets. I can perhaps compliment that. Um, and uh, of course, there were two OG products projects on prediction markets. Um, one, uh, you know, in, on American soil and the one on German soil or Berlin soil to be precise. And, uh, that's of course with, uh, and it was, yeah, Gnosis with, uh, Frederica and Martin and, and the rest, of course. Um, and, uh, being in Berlin, we, we got to know the, the Gnosis books quite well and still do, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, similar to Augur, they were going for prediction markets. 
And kind of the way that I see prediction markets are, there's a broad variety, but the way, you know, generally, um, I, I'll describe by example, let's say you want to um, know what's the chance of Biden winning as president, not Biden, that's zero these days, probably, what's the chance of Harris winning as president versus Trump, right? And then what if you can put your money where your mouth is? So, um, and so you put, you know, you can bet on this, you can put down $100 and maybe a bunch of other people have put down you know, $100 here and there for up and saying, you know, or Harris and other people have put down their money, 100, 1,000, whatever dollars for, um, for Trump. And of course, uh, if here, here's a key thing in prediction markets, if more and more people are uh, betting on Trump, then uh, your potential amount that you can win if Trump actually uh, does win is lower. Whereas let's say 10% of people are going for Trump and you bet on it on Trump, then you could win a lot more, right? So um, you can view it sort of like there's two tokens, one token for betting on Trump and one token for betting on, on Harris, uh, as an implementation and the value of those tokens fluctuate with time. And that also, um, the market cap of the tokens total tells you the relative chance of them winning. Right. And it's sort of a, put your money where your mouth is, but, um, the signal itself of whether Trump or Harris, uh, will win is, is public and people don't have to buy it. Um, and so it's basically this sort of zero sum game among people, um, predict Trump versus Harris, and they can speculate and buy on, um, buy and sell along the way. So it is an Oracle, like you say, and, um, all the things you say, and, um, and it happens to have some of these characteristics. It tends to be for one time predictions, um, you know, who will win as president, uh, and, um, and then with betting along the way all the time with the price of the bets, uh, adjusting based on the supply and demand and eventually it, it resolves. So that's uh, kind of how I see it overall. Um, probably we can elaborate more later. Probably also long-winded, but uh, hopefully it helps to set the stage as we start talking about prediction feeds. Fantastic. So uh, I I will uh, not uh, make make uh, a third. Or maybe I'll make a third one. Uh, <laughs> a, a third explanation, and you guys can synthesize. So in a, in a way, it's kind of a thin. So a prediction market kind of is a trading venue for synthetic assets um, that kind of um, refer to usually future events where the payout is one if it's true and zero if it's not true. Um, and then kind of you have market dynamics along the way that kind of reflect um, the probability of that event becoming true or not becoming true. So that, that, that was kind of like uh, the, the, co the compliment, I hope. So let's, let's talk about um, prediction feeds. H how do they, because kind of in a way, they are similar to prediction markets. Um, in in a way that kind of um, they help you anticipate future outcomes. How are they different? Yeah, they they are very different. Um, that, but there's definitely a lot of similarities. Um, Numerai receives uh, equity predictions, so it's not like anybody is saying I think Apple is going to be uh, worth more than one hundred and ten dollars on this date, and sort of doing it per stock. Uh, on Numerai, uh, it's it's five thousand predictions on every equity in the world um, that is tradable with enough volume, and so it's just sort of set up not on a per asset basis on Numerai, and it's also uh, happening every day. So uh, it's it's really like we're getting a feed of predictions, a stream of predictions each day on these different assets, and so. It makes it a bit different than the event-based uh, type prediction markets. And I, I can perhaps elaborate. So definitely the, the feed is probably the key defining characteristic. It's not these one-offs. It's um, over and over, every five minutes, every hour, every day, whatever. Um, besides that, uh, at least in the implementations uh, that Numerai and Ocean have comp uh, of prediction feeds compared to uh, prediction markets, prediction markets, the, the feed itself is public. And it's a zero-sum game among the participants that are investing. In prediction feeds, um, the, the feed is private unless you pay for it. In the case of Numerai right now, there's exactly one customer for that feed, and that's Numerai the hedge fund. In the case of Ocean, people have to come along and pay money to get access to a feed, typically a 24-hour subscription to access a feed. Um, and that tends to be traders. So basically, that part of the feed, uh, prediction feeds, the feed is public, prediction markets, that signal uh, of you know win versus lose, et cetera, is public, and no one has to pay for it. Um, and then this also means that uh, if it's private, you know, uh, part of the reason it's private is so that people can make money on the other end, or you get them to pay for it, of course, right? 
So um, in the case of uh, Numerai Hedge Fund, I, it's uh, implicitly paying for it as part of the overall flow. In the case of Ocean, I mentioned the pay for. Um, so, the, but yeah, the, the second part here is is zero sum. So uh, uh, imagine uh, with a yeah a prediction market, it's the money going in equals the money going out uh, among the different people making predictions. So it's zero sum among them. Some people who predict well make money, other people lose money. In prediction of feeds, it can be positive sum because there's new money coming into the system from the people making money trading. So um, it, just to, if it was just betting a lot among the predictions every five minutes, there's sort of you know people getting money, people getting slashed, et cetera, back and forth among the, the, predict, uh, the predictors making predictions. But when you have this revenue coming in from uh, you know people paying for the feeds or paying ba- paying you based for your feeds based on the profits, then uh, that flows back to the predictors and then they make money, right? So it's a positive sum game with um, for the um, the data scientists, the people making predictions within prediction feeds. So yeah, to summarize, then it's uh, prediction feeds are feeds, not one-time events. They are typically paid for and private, not public. And it's a positive sum game among the people making predictions versus a zero sum game in the case of prediction markets. But you can you can actually turn prediction markets into positive sum games the same way, right? Kind of you could paywall them and kind of have a bunch of experts kind of place money on on things and kind of then incentivize the experts afterwards, depending on kind of like how they did, right? So. Yeah. I mean, so basically, I think that's kind of like maybe an arbitrary distinction in that kind of that's how they're used, but it's not it's not imminent to kind of what it they is are, a right? little bit in uh, maybe in that uh, to know the price that the current odds are uh, to, to know if you're going to uh, participate in this uh, prediction market against Harris, you would really need to see the current price. And so you, you, you maybe wouldn't want to like uh, bet blind without or, or have to pay to see the current price before you actually participate. But and and to be honest, I, I would see like you you can you know view prediction feeds as iterated prediction markets, but you have to change three characteristics, right? So generally, when you change one engineering artifact, one technology artifact by several factors, if it's sufficiently different, then it uh, probably is helpful to have a new name so as not to confuse it with other things. So we thought long and hard when we were launching Predictor and asked. You know, is this a prediction market? And you know, it chatted with Robin Hansen and with Gnosis folks, et cetera, and realized it probably does make sense to call this something unique, right? And talked it over with Richard and stuff too. Um, and that's that's why we've just um, you know really focused on using this label prediction feeds. But we're not saying you know we're not going to be um, religious about this. Saying uh, it's definitely not a prediction market. It's just much easier to think of them as uh, two different things with those characteristics as the defaults. Um, and, and then, you know, there can be a blurring uh, as you toggle characteristics one way or the other. Uh, and pr- pr- probably the main distinction is the one-offs versus the, the feeds. Yeah, yeah. so kind of one of the things that we haven't talked about yet um, is that for prediction streams, the data is often actually generated by algorithms or AI models. And I mean, this can also be the, the case for prediction markets as we see with kind of like Gnosis AI stuff. But... Um, it's it's the norm for prediction feeds, right? I would say that's right. Yeah, um, it's definitely the norm on Numerai. You can't pro- provide any predictions that's like based on your impressions of uh, Apple or, or something. You really have to build a model um, on all of the equities in in our data universe. So definitely, very much uh, leaning towards AI models and. There's no value to human insights onto stocks on Numerai. So prediction markets, the idea of them has been around for a while and they never really took off until very recently. And we can talk about why, why that is so um, maybe a little bit later. Um, tell us about prediction feeds in traditional finance. Are they things that kind of existed pre uh, Numerai and kind of uh, Web3? Yeah, I would say they have. I mean, in some sense, even signing up to Bloomberg, it's a subscription to a feed of data. It happens to be the live prices, but it's it's kind of an estimate. Uh, no one has all the uh, details of the live prices of stocks because there's dark pools and there's all these small uh, details. Many data vendors would have different price numbers and things like that. So 
that's uh, in some sense the same type of model. And then uh, many data vendors would sell signals and they say, we've made this thing, we've used machine learning and we've used a data set. Uh, we don't have a hedge fund, but we are going to sell this for $50,000 a year. And so that was kind of common. But uh, in some ways, those often were very low quality products. And so why would you sell something if it was so good? Why wouldn't you trade it yourself? And, um, and what's so nice about the staking mechanisms in Ocean and Numerai is that it's saying, the, you know, this actually is high quality because I've staked a lot on it. And you can see it's high quality because look at this track record I've developed. And so that's where it starts to make uh, a particular sense for a blockchain use case. So if you look at um, systems that kind of consume prediction feeds, um, c can you kind of give us an idea which domains they span? Is it just financial or is it also... So you know, I, could, I could imagine things like weather forecasting prediction fees like can can i travel a specific passage with my shipping vessel or um i could imagine kind of like insurance related um things that kind of could be predicted and tracked and so on so is it mostly financial or do we also see them in other venues i could talk to that sure um Yeah, so you know when we were uh, exploring uh, building predictor, we actually looked at a whole bunch of different domains, and um, I, I yeah, we we found that there were uh, prediction feeds in many domains, and um, typically quite often they had different labels in different domains um, and different ways of consuming. So, for example, if you've got an iPhone, you open up your Apple Weather app, and it tells you you know what the forecast is for you know sun versus rain, et cetera, one hour from now, two hours from now, and so on. So you can do that as a prediction feed if you want, right? And it's rolling. So um, one hour from now, it's going to tell you um, the print feed one hour in the future and two hours in the future from that, right? Um, and under the hood, um, there's a lot of data and modeling going on, right? Um, weather prediction is uh, um, a huge sub-industry, but we actually see that it's it's mostly um, via governments, right? So governments, um, they pay uh, national forecast services, um, things like NOAA as part of the USA, And, and more, um, and then that gets uh, you know that outputs um, predictions as APIs that get consumed by things like Apple Weather and stuff. And Apple might have its own AI too. So that's one example within the weather domain. In other domains, um, it's uh, much more um, uh, private. So, for example, in energy forecasting, it turns out there's an 80 billion dollar industry for management of um, energy. Um, so this is basically the software and systems around it to manage energy, um, you know, balancing the grid, all of this sort of thing. And a subdomain within that is a forecasting of energy demand and energy prices. Um, but it's highly regulated. This is where energy trading is, you know, of, of Enron fame, for example. But it's highly regulated, so you don't hear much about it, and it's very opaque, uh, very hard to see. You know, if you talk to people in the energy space, they can tell you a bit about it. Um, but it, it exists, and um, so if you look around, you know, this exists in various places, uh, in usually very, very different shapes and sizes, you know, Bloomberg terminals versus your Apple iPhone versus some REST API, right? And uh, we realize that um, given that we're in the crypto domain, uh, whether the application is crypto or TradFi or otherwise, um, it made sense. There's a lot of, uh, you know, prediction markets are a well-known term there. So it makes sense to have a term that compared and contrasted what a prediction market is versus um, this stream, this feed, right? And that's where we, why we chose that label on um, that way, um, as opposed to just calling it forecasting, because there, there's different stuff going on too, right? You know, if you call it forecasting, it's like, okay, well, how does that differ from traditional Web 2 approaches, et cetera, et cetera. So it's useful to sort of put a stake in the ground for this uh, qualitatively new thing in many ways. You can view it as a, even a, you know, a new um, crypto building block, a new atomic primitive, if you will, that can be used in crypto, whether it's um, you know, shaped uh, the way that Numerai has this technology or ocean technology or otherwise. Can you give us an idea of kind of how the ocean technology is used? So give us an idea of kind of what the things are that are being forecasted, who are they being forecasted by, and who are the consumers of these feeds? Yeah, so our focus uh, for starting is is DeFi. Uh, like mentioned, we did look at a lot of different industries and, you know, talked with a lot of uh, different people. And we saw in terms of the different industries, our criteria were um, what is the um, amount of volume uh, that uh, can go through? 
And uh, what's the latency? You know, if you predict well, how, um, how quickly can you turn around and make money from those predictions? You know, so for example, if you're um, predicting uh, medical um, interventions, you might it, it will take you five years, seven years for those predictions to get FDA approval, et cetera. So you're talking like a you know a clock rate of uh, one clock cycle of five years, say, uh, versus if you're doing say say gaming and you know marketing for gaming, you know prediction of, of market marketing metrics is actually super useful. Maybe you can get that down to a month or maybe even a week. Um, but then if you start thinking about trading, um, TradFi or DeFi or otherwise, you're, you're looking at, you know, uh, minutes if you want, right? Uh, and you can even go to, to sub minutes if you want to get in the realm of high speed trading or MEV extraction, right? The MEV searchers. So um, it's, but the point is it's very high value flow and it's uh, very low latency. So uh, from that, we, we give it out, uh, Ocean had a pretty thorough Web3 stack. We had a lot of stuff around, um, you know, decentralized data sharing, all that, you know, tokenized data access control, including selling data feeds. So we had a lot of off-the-shelf tech. Then um, we, we, you know, started with, we used that as the starting point and then um, basically built an app slash mini stack on top called Predictor. So at the heart of it, you know, whereas, uh, yeah, basically the technology is at the heart of it, it's a smart contract running on, a confidential EVM chain, so a privacy preserving EVM chain, uh, Oasis Sapphire. It, uh, when we went live, it was the only one in production, and it's uh, you know it's been in production about a year and a half and quite stable. And the Oasis team has been great to work with. So that is privacy preserving. Uh, it happens to be using TEE right now uh, until SGX, but you know uh, that keeps expanding too, or is on path to expand to other technologies. So myself uh, as a predictor, a data scientist, I submit a prediction, say that Bitcoin, USTT, pair and Binance will go up five minutes from now. I stake, say 100 Ocean. And, you know, maybe Richard, uh, he predicts that it will go down and he stakes, say 200 Ocean. Okay. And maybe you, Frederick, you stake 100 Ocean going down. So now you've got 300 Ocean going down, 100 Ocean going up for five minutes from now, Bitcoin, USTT, pair and Binance. Anyone who has bought that feed can see that. They'll say, see that it's a 25% chance of going up, 75% chance of going down. And they'll see the total stake up and total stake down, right? 300 down, 100 up. So that's uh, what happens. And then when the actual uh, s uh, true signal emerges five minutes later, then everyone gets paid out or slashed accordingly. So let's say it goes down, then I get slashed. I lose my 100 ocean. And you guys get my 100 ocean. Um, Richard would get two thirds of that. Frederick would get 100. So Richard would get 66, Frederick 33. And let's say that there's sales uh, from traders buying this, and maybe it's another 100 ocean worth of sales. Then Richard would get another 66 ocean from that, and Frederick another 33. Um, and you would get your stake from back from before, too. You're not slashed. So to summarize, I predicted wrong. I lost money. I was slashed. You guys predicted right. You made money. So you got my slashed stake, and you got your um, uh, cut of the revenue and you know how much you got from me uh, from my stake and from the revenue that's pro rata to your stake so so that's how ocean works at the very heart that's all in a smart contract relatively small i think uh you know a few hundred lines of code um all running on sapphire as a erc uc20 a solidity smart contract and yeah it's erc20 too so it behaves like an erc20 uh token too in some ways uh which is pretty neat and that's actually for the for the subscriptions right so you buy a subscription when you buy that you get 1.0 uh, data tokens, basically, uh, that gives you access to this um, feed, right? So that's what Ocean Predictor is at the very heart. And then you're the only, because of the Oasis privacy tech, you're the only one, once you buy this, uh, you're the only one who can see it. Correct. Yes, at first, yes. And then uh, that, that's exactly it. So there's handshaking with, with Oasis uh, to make this visible to the person who's bought it. And there can be more than one buyer right now, right? Too. Um, you know, we'll see in the future because if too many people come along and buy and take advantage, it might diminish the value of the signal, of course, but we haven't seen that yet. Uh, we expect to, we hope to, you know, it, it should happen game theory wise. Um, explain to me why I can't resell. So kind of like say I buy this token that kind of lets me see the feed. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, you could, uh, but this would add a lot of complexity to the system and give, if, if you, um, get closer and closer to, you have to uh, submit your prediction five minutes or greater than when the prediction is due, right? So if you start wanting to speculate and buy and sell and resell in the four minutes, three minutes before, then the prices would change, et cetera. And that gets you closer to prediction markets and that's fine. But we decided to keep um, it very simple and straightforward where it's just, um, you know, every five minutes, boom, every five minutes, boom. And you can have a rolling too. It could be every, every minute you have five minutes ahead, every minute you have five minutes ahead, rolling like that, right? 
but but I can I can only um, predict five minutes ahead. I can't predict say twenty four hours ahead. Uh, we actually have it right now where it's five minutes ahead and sixty minutes ahead. Um, and uh, we did we you know right now you know it's this, the system's a year old. We've been um, focusing our energies towards making sure that everyone in the ecosystem can make money. So we haven't bothered expanding beyond that. Um, we will see. Once you get beyond 24 hours, then it makes much more sense where humans might want to intervene. If it's every five minutes, it would be very tedious for humans to intervene, like Richard was hinting at, right? So robots getting involved. But you know, beyond 24 hours, I, um, it's, uh, I'm not sure if, how much value there is in a prediction feed versus a prediction market. So prediction feeds are, in my view, tuned better for less than 24 hours. Uh, you basically, you know, they can be much shorter timescales. And by not having the speculative aspect in between, it, um, it makes it really clear how, every, how all the incentives work, et cetera. But who knows, maybe in the future, it will be better to have that, right? Just the system that design we have right now doesn't have that. How does this material, materially differ from a futures exchange, right? So kind of say, um, I, if I think about, say, Darabit, um, and kind of the, the, there's kind of like the prediction for, I can see that as a prediction um, of the uh, USDC Bitcoin price 24 hours from now, whatever the intervals are that they offer. Um, couldn't I just kind of use that as a basis and then a hedge? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So they're very complementary. If you squint, you could even call it uh, a future, uh, you know, a, a, style, a type of derivative that happens to be futures-ish. But I would say it's different. And uh, probably the best example of uh, how to, to illustrate is simply you can use um, uh, predictor prediction in order to buy, to make a futures bet, right? And in fact, uh, we actually have a lot of successful experiments internally where it is um, betting on Binance, futures exchange, et cetera, right? So um, if you squint at when, when I'm making a prediction, I am making a bet on something happening five minutes from now, say. But um, it's, uh, it's a slight, you know, the, the, the shape of that bet is different than the, the shape of a traditional future. Of course, if you say you're just doing derivatives of stuff in the future, then it's completely wide open, right? So you can view that this, that the prediction feeds we talk about are a specially shaped type of derivative, right? Um, but it makes it different than the futures as well. Um, yeah, that's how we see it. Uh, and I guess the other thing, and I, I know Richard, you can probably comment on this. In the way that it's shaped, it makes it very easy for non-traders to engage because they're not having to put um, traditional trading money in to trade against the price itself or the future price. They're in, in sort of a more direct way. It's sort of indirect, allowing uh, data scientists to engage on, you know, was, was my prediction accurate, yes or no, without having to engage in the trading more directly. And in some, in some countries, some jurisdictions, you're, you're limited from doing that too, right? So, um, and in, for many people, it's just much less scary to operate on predictions. You know, people that like to participate in data science competitions like Kegel and so on, you can view this like a data science competition with teeth, right? Just before we pass back to, to Richard, tell us about the people or the AIs kind of um, issuing the predictions and the traders consuming it. Do you have kind of like a user profile? Yeah, uh, partly. I mean, we have the user profile we targeted, uh, but we, we don't know exactly who's doing it because it's, you know, uh, fully decentralized and all anonymous, et cetera, right? So this is all on chain. We, we get stats, and uh, if you go to DAP Radar, we have Stats in Ocean Predictor. So uh, we see that there's um, 76 weekly active users. So you can view it as um, you know, 76 wallets that are um, making bets any given week. Um, and maybe some users are running 10 wallets. Maybe it's all a completely individual. We don't know. And then the volume, it's uh, about um, uh, 500,000 transactions per month, about $123 million um, worth of volume per month. Uh, we've actually spiked as high as um, I think like 500 million per month. So Holy Market is getting a lot of um, press around this. We're not really pushing ourselves uh, to get the press. We just know that it's growing. And part of the part of the reason for that is goes back to the target profile, which is we really are targeting the um, the DeFi traders who know their way around Python and data scientists. Data science. So maybe you're you know an AI pro or a data scientist by trade, and you know a bit of crypto. Or maybe you're a, a crypto pro by trade and really know Python and are dabbling in data science. Um, it, so you basically have to have some Python skill and some crypto skill to get into this. But we make it really easy from there. You know, going from you know you go to predictor.ai on the top right, there's a button run bots. It takes you straight to a readme, 
and you know, 20 minutes, you've got um, a, a Python script running that's running your bot on on testnet, right? And then another 10 minutes, you can have it running on mainnet, making predictions. So um, it's really meant to be low friction, but targeting people um, that that demographic, right? Um, people who uh, aren't scared of uh, you know some degree of professionalism in crypto and in Python, but we also want these people not just to run the bot straight out by default. Um, you know, then you can make some money. But if you want to make uh, really good money, you have to have high, more accurate predictions than the next person, right? Because then you can be basically grabbing their, you know, slash stake more often than they grab your slash stake and make money over time from that, right? So that's the demographic. In terms of the traders, it's probably some of the same folks, but uh, even more so, it's, uh, you know, there's a, pro uh, a lot of professional hedge funds out there that quietly operate that you never hear about. Sometimes one man shows, uh, often teams of 5, 10, 15 people. And, you know, being in crypto for so long, we know quite a few of these different teams, right? And we talk to them and, and get feedback back and forth. And how, how we're making sure we do a good job on all this is we're dog fooding it internally. So, you know, internally uh, in Ocean, I, I'm running a team where it's a bunch of engineers. Several of them know data science very well. They all know Python well. Um, and we've got, a, you know, some web app capabilities and whatnot too. And, but uh, our number one KPI inside, inside that team is make money trading, right? Uh, and, and then we pass that off to our users. And by doing that, you know, we, we can have very good empathy for the users. But it's also, uh, yeah, and, and a strong incentive for us to just keep getting better, 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 right? What about you, Richard? So I know who uh, the consumer of your data is, it's namely uh, Numerai Hedge Fund. Um, I remember when we talked about this seven years ago, kind of you were targeting data scientists. How, how has that panned out? Yeah, so it's still data scientists. The data scientists sign up, download the data. You could say they're actually the consumers of the data but we're the consumer of their predictions, which is based on our data and the models that they built upon the data. So everybody downloads the data, they train the models, they submit them, and then they stake them. Uh, and what we get is uh, thousands of models that are all ensembled together. And that ends up being uh, very highly predictive and also lower volatility than, uh, than individual models. And so we're really relying on the ensembling of the different models to have it uh, make it make a good hedge fund uh, at the end of it. And how successful has this hedge fund traded over the last seven years? Uh, yeah, it's been really uh, good. I mean, the we're not supposed to really talk about performance, um, but uh, you know, we can say we can say some general things. Uh, we 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 have very very good. Um, start to the track record. Even though the company started a while ago, um, the actual investing side of the business took a while because we needed to build a community, we needed to get a competitive amount of data, uh, and we need to kind of pioneer uh, staking uh, and our NMR token. And so um, once we got all those things right in about 2019, uh, the fund uh, did very well and grew investor interest. A lot of the investors in our fund are, you know, endowments or pension funds or people like that, the fund is really an institutional uh, product. And so we had a, yeah, we've had a very, very good p period of uh, the last five years where I think all but all but one year has been very, very strong performance. It's been one uh, down year. Um, there's all sorts of qualifiers there. You know, uh, talk about the volatility and the sharp ratio and all that type of thing, but not going to get into that uh, during this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was very clear when when Trent just talked about kind of like how predictor is set up that everything is super decentralized, right? Um, and I think this is less of um, a focus point for Numerai. Um, so t tell us about kind of what are the trust assumptions using Numerai? And um, why why do you think it's fine as is? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, there's some definitely good things and there's some important things uh, that, that are required. I mean, we were not hoping for thousands of individual people to start their own institutional hedge funds. Uh, to do so would cost like $30 million each. And so, in fact, I think a lot of uh, society's uh, capital is wasted on uh, new marginal hedge funds sucking up talent uh, when really you just need one hedge fund that makes it possible for any talent to contribute. And that's really always been Numerai's thesis. So we like the fact that if you have NMR, we cannot take it back from you. 
right? Because it's on a blockchain. That's a nice tool uh, for us. It's much better than having points in a database, having the actual cryptocurrency. Um, we like the fact that for the majority of users, uh, when they're uploading their predictions, they do not have to divulge the IP uh, used to create their model. So their IP really is theirs. We can't uh, take it from them. Uh, we like the crypto a a asymmetry of we've, we we can give you this incredible data set that you can train your model on, but you can't steal it from us and use it for your own trading. So we're kind of using all these different elements of crypto, but ultimately it's much more efficient to have the execution and operation structure of a hedge fund be kind of uh, centralized. And uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, all these other pieces can't be be decentralized. I mean, many users, for example, our users put together a website called Numer Bay. It's like eBay for Numeri, and you can buy and sell Numeri models. There's nothing we can do to sh shut that down. And we don't want to shut it down. Like we don't think it's cool, but we didn't think about it. And that just kind of popped out of the community. Uh, and there are many other examples of that too, where the community's made open source things. There's something called Numer API that a lot of users use to connect to our API. We didn't even write Numer API. It was written by the community. So all of those aspects uh, definitely makes for a quite a healthy decentralized community. But the core investment product, you can't trade equities on a blockchain legally. It has to be a, a, a centralized hedge fund. Let's talk about the elephant in, in uh, the room. And that's uh, AIs and uh, AI models and agents what roles do they play in your in your systems well that's yeah trent and i had a lot to uh to talk about when we first met i think uh, it was maybe fred ursum from coinbase uh who introduced us and um we just had a lot of similar background we were both machine learning people we 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 happened to get into blockchain but uh we both we both knew ai and i think we all we both saw a lot of what was coming in AI, and to me, the the magic piece is somehow is actually the intelligence uh, being built in these systems, not the user interface or the all that stuff's good, but it's really like, did it actually work to predict uh, this very hard to predict thing, and um, and with more investment in in AI there's more data scientists in the world than there were when Numerai started in 2015. And so uh, there's just so much more going on. There's so many new architectures. Some Numerai users, for example, are using transformer architectures uh, in the development of their models. And so it's just like somehow it's kind of all, all been, uh, it's kind of been a long time coming, but it's somehow all being proved out. And I think a lot of the things Trent had done early on and Numera had done, set us up for this kind of time. And yeah, maybe I can add to that too. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, Richard and I, it was great to be introduced right when both Ocean and Numera were getting going and we were swapping white papers and giving feedback and so on. And we've been in touch ever since. Um, so, you know, there's a, I think there's a lot of really cool, um, quiet sort of collaborations that you, people never hear about, but that actually do affect, you know, what gets built, right? And that's, quite, that's, that's really nice. On your question, uh, you know, the elephant of the room, AI. Yeah, I, I, so in Predictor, I didn't mention this in the onboarding when you go through this readme, uh, under the hood, uh, the script that you're going to be launching and running is uh, building uh, an AI model of fly, right? You can have super simple uh, models that are, you know, not even AI, just like a linear regression model or a linear classifier. But then you can get fancier and fancier with things like uh, boosted trees, XGBoost, this sort of thing, or Gaussian process models. Uh, and we have all of that out of the box for you to just uh, put in and set your own parameters. Um, and then you can get fancier yet with, you know, uh, large neural networks, transformer type stuff and so on, all you want. And that's pretty easy to add in um, with your own, uh, without changing the architecture much. And that's nice. Uh, part of the reason, like, we, we went for a prediction was, you know, in Ocean, we thought a lot about um, data marketplaces, of course. We built them over, over the years. And often the, the things that we built, we saw that people, you know, it was chicken and egg. Uh, do people want to... You know, do you try to get lots of supply of data first and then get people to come buy it? Or do you want to get, you know, create people to buy it first and then supply? Or do you want to have sort of like one ecosystem where you've got buyers and sellers somehow together? 
And we realized, yeah, you do want an ecosystem of buyers and sellers together, and then you need to make it really tuned towards um, that ecosystem. And then we realized like it was a key constraint, and maybe this is obvious to any entrepreneur, but it kind of hit a, hit us in the head like a uh, uh, bag of rocks. You know, you have you have to be able to make money, right? So we 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 uh, so you put this in a loop, and it's you know get data, you know you spend money to buy data or create data. From that, you build a model, you know, and then from that you um, from that model you run inference and you get a prediction, and the prediction is the final piece of data. From that prediction, you take action to make more money, and then you loop around. You make more money, create more data, build another model, and make prediction, um, take action from the prediction, make money. Loop, loop, loop. Taking that money made to buy more data that closes the loop. And overall, then we call that the data value creation loop, and it's actually been sort of a, a core thesis um, for us overall. Saying, okay, you know, how, how much money is potentially flowing through this loop, depending on the domain? How quickly can you go through the loop? Um, and that's what led us to um, well, predictions as a first cut. Why? Because it's much more valuable to be at the tail end of a supply chain versus at the beginning. It's better to be a Starbucks than a, co a coffee farmer in, Star in Costa Rica, right? You know, and I grew up as a wheat farmer in Canada, right? Where you know, you're getting a dollar for um, five bush for a bushel of, of, of wheat, you know, that's the equivalent of say, yeah, five gallon pail. So 25 liters worth, right? So for a dollar, right? And then you go and pay, buy a loaf of bread and it's $3 and, you know, you can probably make, I don't know, a hundred loaves of bread from, from that wheat. So overall, the point is it's much more profitable to be at the tail end of the supply chain. And that in data land, that's predictions, right? And that supply chain is both AI and data. It's not just a data supply chain, it's AI and data. And so... So basically, Numerai and Ocean, I think part of the reason we're having success with these is that we focused on the high value stuff first, and then the rest of the supply chain implicitly gets filled in. People are willing to spend the money to do centralized things or, you know, locally set, uh, centralized to themselves. But if you have 50 or 100 of them, then it becomes decentralized to, to, you know, to get the data, to build the models, et cetera. And you provide, you know, low fr you, you know, you give them some guidance to make that low friction. We do see that as time goes on, um, the rest of this uh, supply chain will thicken out. Right, just like um, initially, you know, you had basic su uh, coffee supply chain back in the day, and you you needed coffee buyers, you know, people who want to drink coffee. But then over time, the whole supply chain thickens out, and I see this now as this is how the data supply chain thickens out over time. So working backwards, you know, you can have decentralized model inference, you can have decentralized model training, and so on. But it's not a prerequisite, right? There's a lot of great work happening in that. I'm paying close attention, and um, you know, and we've even thought a lot about doing that ourselves in Ocean. But our focus right now is still focusing on the predictions simply because that's the tail end. And if we do a great job on that, everything else kind of half takes care of itself, right? Uh, so so that's uh, AI and the data supply chain. And of course, this will extend. Um, where I'm most excited about where this can extend is weather prediction. Imagine predicting weather for every one of the 500 million square kilometers on the planet. You've got 500 million square kilometers times about seven key weather metrics, um, temperature, precipitation, humidity, et cetera. That's 3.5 billion feeds. So if you tr start training a model for that, you're going to have a huge ass model. It's going to be super intelligent, just not super intelligent in human shaped intelligence, but super intelligent as in sort of all knowing a lot of the dynamics of the world at sort of a weather time scale, right? So to me, that's super exciting. And, you know, uh, forms of artificial intelligence that the world hasn't seen before, but can be extremely beneficial to society. And I, that's what I really hope where we can take this technology and along the way, you know, help to grow a decentralized data economy. Do you see um, the quality of AI predictions kind of leveling off? If it were possible to kind of make perfect predi predictions, kind of that there, there, there wouldn't be a market left, right? Kind of the market kind of thrives on the inefficiencies to a certain extent. Um, how? So basically, reframing this, how good do you think these models can get? Kind of where kind of the minimum is kind of the noise that's kind of inherently there that kind of you you can't you can't get to vanish. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, it's very hard to know. It'll be hard to even write a proof about you know this is the this is the ceiling of what you could do. And I think obviously it's dual with data though. So that's been the story of of Numerai. If you kind of look at Numerai's back test results, you might say, okay, well, at this date five years ago, we we're seeing sharp of one, and then. It went to 1.2 after we added some more features. And now you just keep adding features and uh, suddenly you, you add a sharp of, of a backtested sharp of three or, or something. And so that's the type of uh, growth you can see uh, even by holding the model constant. So if you hold the model 
parameters constant and just increase the data, that scales the performance. But you could also scale them both. And so you can have the model get 10 times bigger and the data get 10 times bigger. And then that uh, you, you get... So basically, I would say like it's impossible to say there's no better way to make a model. Um, but uh, it is remarkable to me how much uh, we've been able to improve on, you know, we would have very, say, tough periods in the market, say March 2020, where there's so much hedge fund crowding and uh, maybe some of the Numerai mo models all went down at the same time. Well, it doesn't seem like if you had those models now upgraded to the latest data, that that would happen again. And so there's, there's always that type of thing happening. But of course, the same story might be happening inside some other hedge fund. So they would have told you that five years ago, the Sharp was one, and then they improved it. And so there is always the uh, specter of competition. And But one of the special things that we like about Numerai is that the, the returns are quite uncorrelated. I mean, the, the times that we have found to be difficult for us have often been the times that the market's doing well, and factors are doing well, and all the other hedge funds are doing well. And somehow for us, that's a bad, those are, those are tougher periods. But that's a very good thing because it's almost the goal of an investor is to combine a set of uncorrelated return streams. And so uh, it's very good to us that uh, we're different and different in, in a way that's kind of like increasingly better. Do, do you think transformer models are the best we'll see for this? Or do you think there's going to be another step change? Um, one of the great things is, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, 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 I'm, I'm used to be younger, so I was 29. Really? When I, <laughs> yeah, Did you I used and me to both? be <laughs> <laughs> I was 29 when I started Numerai, and I felt like I kind of knew a lot of the frontier things about machine learning and AI. And then I had to become a, you know, as somewhat of a, a jack of all trades, being the CEO of a, of a fund that had a crypto and a community. And I actually, right now, couldn't easily whip up a, a transformer model myself, but luckily. Uh, my past self planned for this moment by creating an open hedge fund where anybody who s suddenly is an expert in transformers can uh, add that intelligence to Numerai to the extent that it can be added. And uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, yeah, kind of how, how I think about it. And, and I, I would say that, yeah, the one best user on Numerai right now, his username is the human peep. And, um, he claims to be using uh, neural networks and transformers. Do you think this is kind of the end or do you think um, there's going to be something better than transformers? I think there will be something better uh, in a way that's uh, probably a lot better. Um, and uh, I do, you know, in some ways, Numerai, we are betting on model innovation, right? If we just had, there was one best model, we would just run it ourselves. Uh, but the, the, we have constantly seen model innovation be possible, not just compute and data, but model, mo uh, the model parameters and the type of model can have a very large effect, especially in this high signal to low signal to noise environment. What do you think, Trent? Uh, yeah, so overall, I, I think it's actually worth giving a shout out to Richard and the Numerai team for increasing their sharp ratio on all these other metrics over the years relatively consistently right so that's a really nice uh demonstrator of the thesis so really like they're not as well known in the crypto space because they really have focused on their customers the the lps into the hedge fund but uh it's really pretty impressive um you know predictor's been live for a year and we have seen the accuracy steadily um uh, creeping upwards um and that's a sign you know there's this arms race among the people submitting predictions and they want to make more money so that's happening in practice and, um, you know, the, the, the incentive structure, um, allows for it, right. Such that there's, you know, more and more people, um, continuing to, to, uh, try different things and whatever works better they use. And, you know, we've at the same time with our internal team, we've also been making advances, you know, we were, we didn't have great solutions to handle non-stationary data at the beginning where the underlying dynamical system, uh, itself changes. And, you know, we've cracked that in a pretty nice way now, for example, internally. And that allows us to train on much more large data sets, et cetera. It's, it's a big unlock, actually. And I'm sure that some of our community members have, have done, that, done that, too. None of the traditional time series methods worked. So, but I've, you know, I've been in AI professionally since the late 90s, and I've seen a huge evolution in AI. So there's no reason that you know, the current state of the art of AI will end. 
as, as a baseline, Moore's law is going to keep rocking along because there's so much money to be made. And, um, you know, we're going to get improvements in compute power. We're going to get improvements in, improvements in data storage. We're going to get improvements in the amount of data. And we're going to get improvements in the AI algorithms themselves. And each of them has their own sort of sub Moore's law and they all combine together. And if you look at the numbers, it leads to about a 10x improvement in AI capabilities year to year to year to year, right? Um, from these different components. So, you know, transformers were a nice innovation. And there's some other, you know, things coming down the pipe, you know, things around um, uh, decision, uh, logic around planning, um, you know, making plans of um, how, how, to, how to decompose a task and then work it out. And there's, you know, some really great planning research going back decades. But, you know, now people are putting this into a, an LM context um, with some pretty cool results. And, you know, chain, chains of logic and trees of logic uh, and reasoning and, and reasoning as synthetic data. Uh, rationale is synthetic data, sorry. So there's a bunch of stuff coming in the pipe right now, you know, um, that sort of freshes in the last half a year and, uh, and it's finding its way into the latest, greatest uh, LLMs. But that's still only a piece of it, right? We're going to see more and more and more um, and in the next few years and it's just not going to stop, right? Until we hit, you know, AGI, which is basically power of human across the board and the other beyond that too. And um, because in, in finance, TradFi and DeFi, there's lots of money to be made um, for sure, you know, a lot of these models are going to find their ways uh, directly into here more and more too. So I'm pretty bullish for AI. I think it's, you know, there's lots of money to be made in many, many domains. And we see that it definitely will happen here. And there's a huge design space to be explored for shapes of AI um, systems. And we're still only at the tip of the iceberg. We've got, you know, we've only covered a fraction of what we're going to see. The world's going to change in huge ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Let's hope, uh, let's hope that uh, most of them are positive. Richard, you recently launched Numerai Crypto, uh, which kind of veers into the direction of Precto. So, so tell us about that and kind of how, how it's similar and different to what Trent has built. Yeah, so I, when Trent was building uh, Predictor, he's like, by the way, we're, we're going to be doing something uh, like this. And then when I was building uh, Numerai Crypto, I was telling Trent, you know, we were thinking about doing this. So we, we definitely, like Trent said, we do feel like this is a collaborative space. Uh, crypto, it's amazing how much it, it works that way. Um, but we just had, with Numerai, uh, a lot of, of data scientists who've signed up over the years. And simply because we've paid them in cryptocurrency, they've learned about cryptocurrency. Uh, many of them hadn't when we first paid them. And so we kind of onboarded a few thousand uh, very bright uh, people to Ethereum by giving them NMR. But the question was, okay, well, Numerai is getting very hard. Why is it getting hard? Well, you have to be, you have to add intelligence to a system that's al ve already very intelligent. And so it becomes harder and harder the more uh, models are being added to the ensemble. And we thought, well, let's uh, create Numerai Crypto, which is exactly like Numerai, Except the universe of stock, the universe of uh, of stocks of five thousand stocks, which is what Numerai normal has, uh, is now just five hundred cryptos uh, that are the highest market cap cryptos uh, that are uh, deduplicated and and a few other things. And we we made that universe, and we said, you know what, we don't have any crypto data, uh, so we're just going to say, bring your own data. Uh, go and find data. You can use news data. You can use any data you want. Uh, but you just have to submit predictions on this universe of 500 stocks. Now, where it's different from Predictor is Predictor is these five-minute predictions. And uh, many, many firms operate on that horizon, including, you know, like a renaissance where there would be many models on this short time horizon. But Numerai had basically specialized in making one-month predictions. Now, it's not because we like hate short predictions or something. It's simply because uh, one month predictions have higher capacity for hedge funds. Uh, so most people don't care. If they can turn a million dollars into two million dollars, they're happy. But uh, a hedge fund that can only turn a bit, that can turn a billion dollars into one billion and one million dollars, that doesn't actually move the needle very much. So if something's got a stressed capacity, um, and usually small cap cryptocurrencies have stressed capacity, then uh, it's not so valuable. But if you can trade over a few days and it doesn't matter how long it takes to get into the cryptocurrency, well, then 
you can make uh, quite a lot more money and so you have higher capacity. So we decided to create this thing called Numero Crypto. You've got these 500 stocks. Everybody started joining and submitting and staking. They're still staking to say that they believe their predictions will work. And we launched it in July. Uh, the prediction horizon is 20 days out. And we did a other, another weird thing, which we've never done before, which is we give away all the predictions. So no one, uh, you don't have, you can't, we don't use the predictions because Numerai doesn't trade cryptocurrency. We just said, we'll just give them back to the users that generated them, but we're going to give them the ensemble of all the predictions added together. And the incredible thing is just how well it's worked. Um, there's been almost no uh, sort of one or two week periods of, of uh, the correlation of the models being negative uh, with subsequent returns. And so um, that doesn't mean it's going to be positive forever. It's very likely to be negative at some point. And this is really an educational, interesting thing. We wouldn't recommend betting all your money on these predictions. But you can go to our website and download the live predictions. And you can start playing with them yourself and see uh, how they work. Um, and see, oh, well, yes, you did. Uh, the meta model did predict this stock right. But it's a very low volume stock. So maybe that's not that valuable. But it also got Bitcoin right. And so that's a very high uh, volume stock. So I could have made a lot of money on that. And so um, ironically, by the way, I don't know if there are any Bitcoin maxis out there, but right now the best uh, coin uh, acro across all 500 is, is, is Bitcoin. The second best is Ether, I think. So it's, it's a skew towards high market cap uh, cryptos right now. Um, whereas sometimes it's not, it's very different. So that's what it is. And it's just been really fun to watch because it's been a kind of, um, it's just been kind of for fun. Um, we wanted to have another use case for NMR. And so now $600,000 per day is staked on these predictions. And, um, it's just been a really cool thing to watch. And it's nice to see people using them and thinking about these predictions and trying to maybe turn them into a trading strategy. But for now, Nibirai doesn't have plans to do so ourselves. But if I get this correct, uh, then kind of currently you're kind of pay paying for these predictions that you're not actually using. So how is that sustainable? Yes, so we pay them uh, from our treasury and, uh, and uh, it's really to seed the whole thing and, and see what happens. Uh, we don't pay that much. You know, the vast majority of our payouts are going to the equities predictions. But um, we are paying some to the crypto predictions to, to seed it and see what happens. And I think it benefits Numerai if we have more stuff for users to do, more reasons to stake NMR instead of uh, sell it. Um, and we can always do anything we want with these in the future. Um, there are many crypto funds that have, say, recently maybe bought NMR uh, or something. Now, they, they might trade uh, they might trade cryptos and they could ask us, uh, you know, hey, can we get this exclusively or, or, or something like that? Now, I hope it doesn't go that way. I wouldn't want it to just be a kind of exclusive thing. But um, right now, it's just, uh, it's just very interesting to watch and, and it's amazing how much, how good it is. I mean, for a perspective, um, it's very good to get sort of 2% correlation with uh, equities. Um, but this has 9% correlation uh, with the subsequent returns of crypto. So it's just a very, very much, much, so sort of like worked way better than we thought it would. And it almost, yeah, it kind of gives me an indication why Trent is excited about uh, what he's doing because he's probably seeing similar things on the shorter horizon. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, uh, certainly, I, and I'm very excited for the the results you guys have had with uh, Numerai on these longer timescales. And yeah, we've seen, you know, in the five minute horizon, actually, it's it's hard to get a lot of signal. But once you get to one hour, four hours, eight hours, it's it gets uh, really nice. You know, probably the, you know, it starts to be really nice at about four hours, right? Um, so, but even on, um, you know, five minutes, you can get on the order of, uh, you know, baseline 52%, but as high as 65%, depending on on the token and stuff too. Uh, accuracy, that predicting up talent, right? Um, and 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, I think we fully, we both agree that there's a lot of, um, uh, maybe not low hanging fruit, but medium hanging fruit for our predictions in, in DeFi and what we're doing, you know, it's, it's complementary on purpose, you know, uh, I, I, in at least a couple of dimensions, one is time scales, Numerai is focused on longer time scales. And the second dimension is just the structure and incentives of Numerai versus, uh, ocean predictor, you know, um, so Numerai is a, a, a hedge fund that uh, is that single customer for those feeds. And so you get paid in that, that way, that way. In Ocean's case, it's um, a feed with many, many buyers. And so it's, you know, just d different payoffs. You could have, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that there's people that are participating in both the Numerai competitions and the Ocean predictions, you know, for, um, you know, the 20 day stuff as well as the five minute stuff and everything in between. Uh, that's great, right? Um, and uh, I think those are the, probably the two main dimensions of, of difference. And then uh, overall, though, I, um, and I guess you'll get to this, Frederick, but, you know, what, what are the, there's many potential points of collaboration, and we've started going down this path more so, right? So um, around the same time Numerai uh, Crypto was launched, I think a week later, uh, we launched with Numerai um, a, a data challenge uh, called Crypto Factor Modeling Data Challenge. So this is basically some of the uh, stuff Richard was describing, but where people can submit what they did into um, this ocean data challenge, describe what they did, you know, because with if you're just pure numerai, you get to stay opaque. But if you want, you can put this into a PDF, describe what you did, and, and then um, how well you do, as well as your description, et cetera, can lead to prize money. And it was on the order of $20,000 um, worth of prize money and came out uh, pretty interesting, right? Um, and that's- Yes, it just, uh, it just ended. So yeah, it was a really nice uh, kind of collaboration. Everybody knows the factors in equities, like, you know, it's sort of like in textbooks, it's like size, momentum, value, uh, beta, all these factors uh, uh, determine some of the stock returns. But in crypto, it's not actually really known what the factors are. And so by kind of uh, doing this collab, uh, this sort of competition uh, to find factors uh, in partnership with Ocean, we got uh, a, a great deal of new interest in that field. And if we get good at that, uh, it helps us may do all kinds of things, including have better scoring on Numerai, where we neutralize factor risks from the from predictions and so on. So um, yeah, it's uh, been, a, been a good start to, to doing something together because we always talk about doing things together, but we haven't really done it properly yet. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things, like you know, uh, Frederick, you had mentioned, you know, and pointed that a, a lot of numerized infrastructure is centralized. So Richard and I talked about this and realized, for their business model, there's less incentive to have it fully decentralized. It just doesn't matter as much, right? And that's fine. And if they, if there was specific aspects where decentralization is really useful, then cool. Now you've got, you know, the ocean predictor contracts that you can basically, you know, numerai can deploy and we can work with, and that's a, 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 an obvious point of collaboration. But interestingly, because of the the slightly different uh, business models and incentive structures, it's not necessarily needed as much, which is kind of interesting, right? Uh, but that also points to then, um, uh, you know, complementary user bases, at least on the on the consumption side, right? And on the supply side, I think it's actually, um, you know, people who become experts at one can cross over their expertise to the other and vice versa, right? So, um, and that's, that's I see, what, 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 you know, is happening for sure. And at least, uh, at least one or two people and probably more um, and will happen more in the future too. So, um, yeah, I, I, and, but because that, you know, ocean is now doing stuff, uh, in the last year with predictor much closer to what Numerai is doing and Numerai is also, you know, dabbling in, in, in crypto. It's, it's the perfect time to, you know, find excuses to work together and, and uh, then, you know, make, make, um, extra high values. Yeah. What t tell us more about, uh, the, the potential future collaborations that kind of you envis uh, envisaging. There's so yeah, I would say that trend has uh, has uh, stayed ahead of of multiple things. So for example, I, there's no one at Numerai who's who's an expert at uh, o Oasis, uh, which Predictor uses. And you could see you know versions of Numerai Crypto or something like that where we might want to use that. And therefore, uh, working with Trent's team on a project to do with that could be very very useful. Um, and we would be sharing the right skill sets. In some sense, Numerai's team used to be, you know, maybe half blockchain engineers and half website engineers. And now it's like 90% uh, trading and hedge fund ex in, uh, execution 
uh, engineers and and researchers and so it's sort of like are the makeup of our company is designed around our customers which are our investors which we care uh, the most about and have a fiduciary duty to be you know to put them first whereas some of the crypto stuff especially because we've been yeah, yeah, like sometimes we get excited about doing something in crypto and then the gas prices would be 10 times higher than we could we could do it, manage it and so on. Uh, but I that's that's where I think it could work. We he basically his team knows more about blockchain, we might know a little bit more about quant finance. Yeah, you guys certainly know a lot more about quant finance and but we're learning and we're bringing in we find ourselves bringing in more trading and tradify people too just to to buff up our own expertise. Um I think a, a good example of of collaborations and where this can go. I had mentioned earlier in this podcast about prediction feeds as a new type of uh, crypto building block, right? So we've got oracles, uh, chain, chain link style, where, um, you know, the traditional definition of oracle is actually a future prediction, right? But in, in crypto land, uh, it happens to be that uh, a chain link style oracle is uh, simply a, a feed, uh, typically of crypto prices or of existing data, right? So uh, if you want to have forecasts or predictions on top of that, perhaps you call it a future oracle if you want to think about it as a crypto building block. Or if not future oracle, then simply prediction feed, right? But once you have that, then there's lots of um, crypto products that can be built on top. For example, there are quite a few um, decentralized derivatives projects, right? Where um, people are building different sort of futures trading strategies, options, and so on. All of that could um, could uh, leverage uh, decentralized predictions quite well right um especially once you know predictor extends to have continuous value predictions and volume volatility which is one of the directions for us of course um beyond that too if you're you know doing a um a loan protocol um you could you might be able to reduce the collateralization ratio from instead of 180 percent maybe down to 120 percent um if you can uh predict um volatility better right because then you need less time to react and similarly for stable coins that are based on collateralization. And then also for DEXs, uh, where you're do the LPs are, you know, adjusting their their weights in things like balancer or adjusting their threshold in, in things like the you know pseudo order book he set up that Uniswap has and so on. All of these could leverage predictions in order to do a better job. And of of course, if if you can run this stuff all as its own new protocol on top that combines these existing protocols plus this new building block of uh, prediction feeds, then you can get, you know, basically um, a much more interesting behavior, you know, optimize all of this existing DeFi infrastructure, like I mentioned, whether it's uh, 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 derivatives or uh, loans or stable coins or DEXs, uh, and also open the opportunity to, to new uh, primitives that are higher levels. So that's an example. Um, yeah, and, you know, Ocean can do that on its own, but then we, with Numerai, we can pull in stuff from, um, you know, imagine the Numerai TradFi stuff and the Numerai expertise. So there's a lot of back and forth there. Uh, or, you know, Numerai itself building some of these um, things on top, right? So there's just um, basically because of where Predictor is and Numerai is, we've increased the surface area of possible uh, ar technology artifacts, right? Uh, increase the size of the adjacent possible, if you will. And from that, you know, Ocean can reap rewards, Numerai can reap rewards, and any other um, adventurous builder. So, final question. Prediction on prediction feeds in the next two years. What's going to happen? What are we going, going to see that may be surprising? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I must say I haven't followed, um, is it Polymarket? Polymarket? Yeah, yeah I, I was sad that Augur... <laughs> Uh, didn't end up working, but I'm very, very happy that someone's uh, taken the taken, and they seem to be doing an unbelievable job. But I wish I knew more of the technical details. Uh, but I'm very happy to see that because it's always been for me. It's like um, uh, stable coins and prediction markets and prediction feeds. You know. Oh, that's very, very 2017 of you. I know, but it's like it's like what what's better than those things? Um, and uh, and so you know because those things actually catch AI in the web and that's what's so cool about them so um yeah that would be my prediction is that there's more of, there's a lot more of this and um it is the vector for ai to kind of express uh blockchain yeah no i i can explain to you how a polymarket works 
uh, because it actually uses Gnosis uh, conditional token framework, and we built it uh, years ago. No way! Uh, but uh, that, yeah, but that, that's that's a story for for another time. Okay, I'll um, find. There's probably another podcast about that one. <laughs> Trent, uh, what about you? Prediction on prediction feeds. Yeah, I mean, I think overall prediction feeds will find themselves playing a role in the broader world of AI. You know, mainstream has, you know, learned about AI within the last couple of years in, in spades, right? You know, me and my friends would hang out all the time going back to the 90s talking about it, right? So it to me, it's wonderful that a lot more people talk about it and what the future holds with AI and the philosophical inclinations and societal risks and societal uh, gains potential, right? And as these... Um, uh, AIs, uh, you know, more and more powerful AIs get built. Um, some will be centralized, some will be decentralized, and both the centralized and decentralized ones are going to want to be using um, the prediction feeds to to make better decisions, right? So it's not just for pure trading, you know, that's the near term stuff, but for any sorts of decisions, right? Already we're seeing, you know, like ChatGPT and stuff hooking onto different um, APIs to, to do what it does. Well, there's nothing stopping it from hooking into you know, this API, this stream of, of ocean predictions and numerai predictions, potentially, you never know. Um, so there's that. and But this will actually unlock a lot more power, right? Because you can have AI systems, if you have like super awesome weather prediction, uh, which I hope, you know, maybe not, you know, global in a two-year time frame, maybe, but three, four, five, who knows? Um, and incentives are a powerful thing. Um, then uh, with super awesome weather prediction, it will, you know, have big impacts on... Um, improving safety, whether you're flying or driving otherwise, and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff we probably can't even predict, but just sort of I, macro level, I see that prediction feeds will catalyze the AI space. That's probably the biggest thing. And I also see that um, they can help to catalyze the DeFi space by uh, um, increasing the capital efficiency. Um, and uh, also the TradFi space, as Richard and the Numeri team are showing. And you know, so that's some of the basics. So in improving AI. Uh, generally, uh, improving the the FI, the FI spaces, uh, FI, and then beyond, like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, wet weather prediction, etc. And one of my pet dreams is to have a super intelligent AI emerge by uh, that is actually you know a single large model trying to predict the weather dynamics of every square kilometer on the planet. Right? I think that'd be really cool to see. Um, and by the way, there's going to be another big side effect, which is part of the point of predictor, which is this will be one of the leading horses pulling all along the whole decentralized data economy, right? Um, you know, now there's um, already, uh, there's good money in making predictions, right? Doing it at Numeri or, or Ocean. Um, but um, then working backwards, just like Richard had talked about, there's this decent, the, this market, uh, Numerbay uh, for the models. Uh, we can see more and more of that stuff and thickening out, thickening out the rest of this decentralized data supply chain. Um, and so overall, all of this stuff is going to catalyze decentralized AI um, for really the large scale models. And that's pretty exciting. So, so yeah, that's where we're headed. Fantastic. So where do we send people to find out more about Predicto and Numerai? So Numerai, uh, if I would, the one I was talking about crypto, I would, I would go visit that one first. It's uh, crypto.numeru.ai uh, slash meta hyphen model. That will give you what the model's predicting right now, and you can download the predictions. Uh, and you'll also find a way to sign up there. But there's also numeru.ai uh, for main numeri, if you're a machine learning person or uh, a data scientist. Without any data, then that's great because you can download our data from there. What about uh, Predictor? Yeah, so uh, predictor.ai. So Predictor has two O's. Um, and from there, you'll see a, a table that looks a bit like CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap. And, you know, scanning the table and looking at it, you can sort of quickly grok um, how predictor is behaving and so on. And you actually get the Bitcoin feed of five minutes for free. So um, play with that too. And then, like mentioned earlier, you can go to the top right, click on Run Bots. That will take you to a readme for running um, prediction bots and actually trading bots too. So you can have your own trading bot running live on Binance, et cetera. Um, you know, so so that's that's the main way to get going on Predictor, uh, going to predictor.ai. Your Bitcoin wins free? Yeah. So yeah, maybe that's interesting. I mean, maybe someone's already using our API to predict on yours or vice versa, and that's very interesting. Yeah, I could see that. Cool. Thank you both for coming on. That's been super interesting. Um, and uh, 
yeah, have have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.